The Journey to the East from Chapter 2 Each participant in this unforgettable journey had his own ideas as to what made our faithful Leo suddenly decide to leave us in the middle of the dangerous gorge of Mauro Inferiore. It was only very much later that I began in some measure to suspect and review the circumstances and deeper significance of this occurrence. It also seemed that this apparently incidental but in reality extremely important event, the disappearance of Leo, was in no way an accident but a link in that chain of events through which the eternal enemy sought to bring disaster to our undertaking. On that cool autumn morning, when it was discovered that our servant Leo was missing and that all search for him remained fruitless, I was certainly not the only one who for the first time had a feeling of impending disaster and menacing destiny. However, for the moment, this was the position. After we had boldly crossed half Europe and a portion of the Middle Ages, we camped in a very narrow rocky valley, a wild mountain gorge on the Italian border, and looked for the missing Leo. The longer we looked for him, and the more our hopes of finding him again dwindled during the course of the day, the more were we oppressed by the thought that it was not only the question of a popular, pleasant man amongst our servants who had either met with an accident or run away, or had been captured by an enemy, but that this was the beginning of trouble, the first indication of a storm which would break over us. We spent the whole of the day far into the twilight searching for Leo. The whole of the gorge was explored and while these exertions made us weary and a feeling of hopelessness and futility grew amongst us all, it was very strange and uncanny how, from hour to hour, missing servants seemed to increase in importance and our loss created difficulties. It was all, not only that each pilgrim, and without doubt the whole of the staff, were worried about the handsome, pleasant and willing youth, but it seemed that the more certain his loss became, the more indispensable he seemed. Without Leo, his handsome face, his good humour and his songs, without his enthusiasm for our great undertaking, the undertaking itself seemed in some mysterious way to lose meaning. At least, that is how it affected me. Despite all the strain and many minor disillusionments due to the previous months of the journey, I never had a moment of inner weakness, of serious doubt. No successful general, no bird in the swallow's flight to Egypt, could be more sure of his goal, of his mission, of the rightness of his actions and aspiration than I was on this journey. But now, in this fateful place, while I continually heard the calls and signals of our sentinels during the whole of the blue and golden October day, and awaited again and again with growing excitement the arrival of a report, only to suffer disappointment and to gaze at perplexed faces, I had feelings of sadness and doubt for the first time. The stronger these feelings became, the clearer it seemed to me that it was not only that I had lost faith in finding Leo again, but everything now seemed to become unreliable and doubtful. The value and meaning of everything was threatened. Our comradeship, our faith, our vow, our journey to the East, our whole life.